start by saying welcome to the 43rd annual Hartman Institute Conference. Welcome to Utah, welcome to Salt Lake City, and welcome to my academic and professional home, Westminster College, in particular the Bill and Vive Gore School of Business. If you're a skier and you wear Gore-Tex, you know who Bill and Vive Gore are. They're the founders of W.L. Gore and Associate, and they are patrons of our college. So welcome. I never knew Robert Hartman, but I'm beginning to feel as if I do. And I know that sounds strange, so I thought I should explain. Hartman died in 1973. I first learned of his work in 2002. Intrigued but confused at how difficult it was, uh, I immediately tried to read everything about formal axiology that I could get my hands on and discovered there wasn't much. It's ironic because Hartman was a prolific writer, but in his lifetime, only one book in English was published by Hartman. When he died in 1973, Hartman's widow, Rita, donated his unfinished manuscripts, his finished but unpublished manuscripts, his lecture notes, his speeches, much of his correspondence to the University of Tennessee Special Collections Library, where he was a professor. There, these documents, most of them are carbon copy, onion skin, typewritten pages. Over 100,000 pages of Hartman's work are sitting in cardboard boxes at the University of Tennessee. Most of them have never been seen by human eyes in 40, 50, and even 60 years. In 2018, I had the good fortune to receive a small research grant, which enabled me to take two of our undergraduate students with me to spend 10 days at the archives in the Hartman Library. Uh, one of those students is Jen Rowley, if you'll raise your hand, Jen who has since become an, an avid student of the theory of formal axiology. Jen graduates with a degree in psychology in about seven weeks, and we'll be putting this to work in her future career. So I'm so grateful to Jen for 10 days using iPad cameras and a digital wand scanner. We comb through the archives looking for everything that we thought was complete enough and written in English that we could read that um, may be suitable for bringing to the world. And with Jen's help, we, just, we, we um, scanned and digitized approximately 2,500 pages of Hartman's work. We are now in the process of beginning to bring those uh, into editing and publication. I'm proud to say that the first one uh, was released in April. Hartman's five lectures on formal axiology. If you've read some of the published books, a lot of people referred to it, but didn't know what it was. So uh, we've now published a small paperback. It's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And I, I believe it's the most accessible to date of Hartman's own writing. Because if you tried to read the structure of value, if you're like me, you went to sleep. Um, but this was designed, these were delivered as lectures around college campuses, and I find it uh, an easier introduction to what we're doing. I'm working right now on editing uh, uh, a collected writings of Hartman's on the subject of war and peace with a tentative title of Beyond Sovereignty. I, hope, <laughs> I thought I'd have that finished in June. It might be January before it's done, but that's the next one in our, in our planned progression. We have three or four more in the works. We'll be sharing more about that with you this afternoon. Anyway, I want to describe that because I'm here to tell you that if you sit down and read and reread and then transcribe by retyping word for word three to 400 pages of what someone else has written, by the time you're done, you feel like you know that person. So that's what I mean when I say, even though I never met Robert Hartman, I'm beginning to feel as if I know him. And the more I know him, the greater my admiration grows for the breadth and the depth of this man's thought. With that admiration in mind, I'd like to start this presentation this morning in a way that I believe Hartman probably started a lot of his, and that is with a question. My question is, is humankind better off today than we were, say, 400 years ago? And I would like to answer that by saying in many ways, especially in our physical and material well-being, the answer is certainly yes. 
Now, the consultants in the group may say, well, Cliff, it depends on how you measure well-being. And I understand that. It, there's some subjectivity here. Um, but there are two measures of human well-being in the terms of physical and material well-being that are so widely accepted they're hardly disputable. And that is life expectancy at birth and personal income adjusted for inflation. I'd like to share with you an animated graph that describes this progression of life expectancy and personal income over time. In this graph, you see life expectancy on the vertical scale and personal income adjusted for inflation in 2011 dollars on the horizontal scale. There's a little green dot here which will represent the United States and that's what will follow. There's a large shaded date in the background, 1800 is when we start. This data doesn't go back more than about 200 years, but we can assume that life expectancy and personal income were fairly flat throughout that time. So this green dot, if the population grows, is gonna get bigger as the date scrolls in the background. And if it moves up, it means life expectancy is increasing on a linear scale. And if it moves to the right, it means personal income is increasing in a geometric scale. You'll see that scale increases geometrically. So let's see if we are better off today than we were 200 years ago. For the first part of, eight, of the 1800s, personal income was rising dramatically, but life expectancy didn't. That dip in life expectancy is the U.S. Civil War, after which life expectancy improved until another war, World War I, caused a slight dip. After which, except for a dip in personal income in the Great Recession of 20, 1929, look at what's happened to both life expectancy and personal income in 200 years in the United States. Those bubbles in the background show over 100 different countries with the same demographic projection. So folks, I want to argue that yes, in many, many ways, we certainly are better off than we were 200 years ago. In fact, it's said that if the founders of the world's great religions were to reincarnate here today, they would be in awe. Just, just imagine for a minute here that say Abraham and Jesus and Mohammed and Buddha, Confucius and Lao Tzu, suddenly just popped up here on stage, right here beside me. They would look around and they would go, wow, some of you are so old. <laughs> People didn't live that long when we were around. They would look up at the ceiling and look at the span of the ceiling and say, how can it stand up without columns in the middle? They would look at the lanterns burning in the ceiling. They would notice that some of you are holding small lanterns in your hand that you glance down at occasionally. And none of these lanterns are even giving you off smoke except the Samsungs. <laughs> They'd be amazed that my voice is amplified as if by magic and that this painting on the wall behind me can change almost on command without waiting for the paint to dry. The world would be vastly different than these religious founders were accustomed to. And yet, it said if they picked up the morning paper and read about the hatred, the abuse, the violence, the crime, and the wars, they would shed a tear because in some ways, nothing has really changed. So I want to ask, what's the difference? How have we moved so far forward in 400 years in our physical and material well-being, but have stayed where we are socially and morally? And I will advocate, as Hartman taught us, that we give a lot of credit to this fellow, Galileo Galilei, for the advancements in our physical well-being, because he came up with a very simple formula, speed equals distance divided by time. Galileo was the first person to understand that there is a logic underlying the physical world. That logic, by the way, happens to be a mathematical logic. And this first expression of that mathematics, of simple motion over time, did not radically change the world in Galileo's lifetime. It did not change it in 100 years, but it got the ball rolling. And over the next 400 years, with the genius of folks like, like Newton and Leibniz 
and Turing and Bertinelli and Einstein, building on the foundation that Galileo started, and tens of thousands of lesser known mathematicians, scientists, and engineers have given us the physical world we live in today. The result, we have air conditioning, electric lamps, we have skyscrapers, we have automobiles, we have airplanes, we have Wi-Fi, all of which were built on the basis of Galileo's work. Socially, morally, and ethically, though, we remained in the Middle Ages. Whereas physically, we've gone from alchemy to chemistry, from astrology to astronomy, from bloodletting and incantations to the miracles of modern medicine. Socially, we're dealing with the same issues that we dealt with 2,000 years ago. So I got to wondering, what if? What if someone someday could discover a logic underlying the social and moral world that would eventually be just as effective as the mathematical logic that Galileo used to discover the logic underlying the physical world? And to our good fortune, someone has done that. And you know who it is. Robert Hartman found that logic. Not a mathematical logic, but an axiologic. In fact, he called it formal axiology. Axiology means essentially the study of human values. Hartman called his formula or his theory a formal axiology because it is deducted from a small number of axioms. Basic among those axioms are that there are three levels of value. Many of you know this. He called, we refer to them often as I, E, and S. In layman's terms, they refer simply to people things, and ideas. Each of these three levels of value can be valued in each of the same three ways. I call them through empathy, action, and thought. These three concepts of value give us a hierarchy, which, as Rem Edwards says so elegantly and so simply, the essential of formal axiology is that people are more important than things or ideas including ideas about things or people. This very logic is what underlies the Hartman value profile that many of you are such scholars and students of. And thanks to a group of pioneers, one of whom is with us today, Art Ellis, and Charlotte, if she's in the room, um, who found, hi Charlotte, who founded the Hartman Institute to preserve, refine, and advance his work. Thanks to their pioneering work, like Galileo's, their work, Hartman's work is not lost. It has been preserved, it's up to us to advance it. Sometimes I get in a reflective mood. I go home from a day of teaching and I, I think, gosh, what, I'll turn on the news, and I think, what if, thanks to Hartman's work, in 400 years, we have evolved as much socially and morally and ethically as we have in our physical environment in the previous 400. What if in 400 years we have a world without violence, without hate, without prejudice, without wars? What would that be like? I then sometimes ponder, I think, Cliff, what if, what if in some small way, through my involvement in the Institute, through my research, through my teaching, what if in some small way I'm able to make in my lifetime a contribution to that improvement in humankind? What if perhaps I'm able to introduce a student to this theory who goes on to become the next Newton or the next Einstein of formal axiology? And I feel that would mean I would have a life of consequence. And I get all warm and fuzzy inside. It feels good. And I dwell on that for a while. But every now and then, a different feeling creeps in. And that feeling is a fear. And my fear is, frankly, folks, what if we don't have 400 years to figure this out? In 1973, shortly before he died, Hartman was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for his work arguing against nuclear proliferation. 
At that time, there were only two nuclear-capable countries in the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. Today, there are 11. Today, the leader of any one of those 11 countries, in a moment of fear, anger, or vengeance, could push a button that would start a chain of events that within 45 minutes would end civilization as we know it. Albert Einstein once said, I do not know with what weapons World War III will be fought. But I know for certain that World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. So folks, I want to say that the obligation is upon us to do something, to do something within our power starting today, starting this week, starting at this conference, to change the world for the better while we can. The opportunity is there, the need is great, time may be of the essence, and Robert Hartman has pointed the way for us. All we have to do is pick up the baton and keep carrying it. Now that's a big task for a small group of people to put on our shoulders. I'd like to propose that we can individually and collectively do this. If everyone in this room commits to doing at least one of four next steps, that next step would depend on where you are in your journey into the Hartman Value Profile and a formal axiology. Let me outline Cliff's recommended four steps for you. Step number one, if you are brand new to this, in my language about IES and HVP and Hartman Value Profile don't mean anything for you, then the first thing to do is to take the assessment. And chances are very good you're sitting within three feet of someone right now who makes their living administering and interpreting for people these assessments. So ask them, can I take it? Can I learn what you guys are all talking about? Will you do that? Next, if you are an avid user of one platform, one version of the HVP, and you are not also conversant with the ways that other people measure, report, and describe results for the HVP, I would say you're dealing with only one side of a coin. There's a lot more you can do if we learn from each other about what to do to make these reports come alive. In the 50 years since the Hartman Value Profile was written, to my knowledge, there are about a dozen people or organizations who have completed their own uh, customized computerized scoring platforms. There are probably three or 4,000 consultants around the world who are using one or more of those platforms in their consulting work. This gives us both an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is that Hartman's original verbiage around this was obscure and difficult to understand. And I tip my hat to those of you who found ways to explain it more simply to people who are not deeply immersed in this. I thank you for that. Those of you who developed your own method of giving feedback one-on-one -on -one to someone in an ever richer manner, I welcome that. and. Uh, ask you to share what you do and what's working and what's working with others. And by the way, this is not an exclusive list. This is not a comprehensive list. It's a list of those platform providers that I know out there. That's the opportunity to learn and share best practices from each other. But this opportunity also brings a challenge to all of us. In the Old Testament of the Bible, the story is told of the ancient Babylonians who decided to erect a tower so tall that it would actually reach to heaven. They were going to call it the Tower of Babel. And they began constructing this tower, and God said, I don't really want humans up here in heaven. So he decided to intervene and keep them from finishing the tower. Now, God being God, he could have rained down upon them an inferno. He could have uh, sent to them a plague, but he did none of those. What God did instead was make the Babylonians all speak different languages. And went, after which time they could no longer communicate, and when they could not communicate, they spoke Babel to each other, and construction of the tower ceased. 
folks here at the Art Hartman Institute, because of so many ways that we have found to express and define and interpret this HVP, we also run the risk of speaking babble to each other. There's a version of the assessment that I use a lot that I'm accustomed to talking about strength of judgment and balance of judgment as primary scores in there. Those very same clumps are described by others as clarity and focus scores. Those of us who refer to balance of judgment and focus scores, there are other people who talk about bias and valence. Four different words for the same part of the same instrument. We speak babble if we don't translate to each other what we're talking about. Hartman's original scoring methodology was very non-intuitive. On many but not most of the scales, a low score meant a higher, a better score. It meant a stronger score because it meant less deviation from Hartman's theoretical norm. But that's not how most people are accustomed to reading scales. You know, we live in what I call a Boderic world where 10 is higher. Okay, so there are actually logical service providers who've converted those scores to where a higher score is better than a lower score on a 1 to 10 or a 1 to 100 scale. That's a great step forward to help it be easier for the respondent to understand. But it means if we're not conscious about what we're saying to each other, if I say so-and-so got a high score on this, if you don't know which I'm talking about, we're speaking babble. So let's be sure we translate whatever platform you're using so it's understood by others. And if it's not understood, let's ask and say, Here's, am I understanding this right? Here's how I come from. Does that make sense? My third step, if you are intimately involved with a particular version of the Hartman Value Profile, you know it inside and out, and you are conversant with all the other versions of interpretation, including the manual of interpretation out there, I still say, and yet you stop your engagement with a client when the profile review is done, I will say you're not playing with a full deck. You're leaving richness of value on the table. If you do not also extend to your clients a deep understanding of the theory of formal axiology and how it can be used in organizational and individual decision making. Bob and Rita Hartman had one child, a son named Jan. About 40 years after this photo was taken, Jan Hartman wrote a letter to the Hartman Institute to be read at the start of this meeting. I was not here then, or I wasn't at the Institute then. I believe his message in 1984 is as pertinent to all of us today as it was then. So I would like to read an extended excerpt from Jan's letter to the Hartman Institute to all of you. Now in this letter, he refers to the HVI, or Hartman Value Inventory. That's the same instrument I'm accustomed to calling the Hartman Value Profile. Apparently it was known in some circles anyway as the HVI in the beginning. Jan writes, I wanted to be at the meeting this year but Kabi, our oldest daughter, graduates from college this weekend. It might interest you to know that she plans to go on and study philosophy and psychology for many reasons, one of which is that, in her words, she feels the shadow of her grandfather with her all the time. I want to talk about different shadows. We live in a shadowed world where the urgency to define the values by which we govern ourselves and others is profound. The emotional inspirational process toward axiology began when my father was a child and saw his favorite uncle sent off to fight the First World War. Later, my father watched the Hussars and the SS march through the streets of Germany. The question he asked then is as painful and provocative today. If evil can be organized so effectively, why not good? Now, 11 years after he died, very little work has been done to apply his value theory to the larger issues. 
He had planned to do it. He outlined a book called The Revolution Against War. He had planned books about applying value theory to economics, sociology, and history. He was working on an essay on the nature of violence. To my mind, Jan continues, nothing is more important to his legacy than this. I am talking less about formal applied axiology than I am about finding every possible way to make my father's ideas available to a mass public. Now I'm fully aware that for business and other reasons, the Hartman Value Inventory has been the most widely exploited of my father's legacies. In a way, I regret that he spent so much time developing the HVI. But I say, fine, all men of goodwill and good heart deserve to prosper. In the times we live in, there is a more valuable place for all of you to be investing your time. By the standards of axiology itself, there is greater value in working to educate men's souls than in measuring the dimensions of their psyches. I don't think there is one of you who can in conscience tell me that the broadcasting of his ideas is not the first endeavor of this institute. I want to ask all of you to reach out beyond yourselves and your immediate interest to find what you can do to popularize Hartman's value theory. And don't mistake the hundreds or thousands of people exposed to the HVI are not converts to value theory. They aren't. They are merely receiving a useful service which they accept on a practical level. You all have a duty to serve what I feel was the best in my father's work, his insight into the nature of ethics, and his faith that man can learn to value his world in a creative and potentially life-generating way. We owe it to ourselves and our communities to help create a world in which the misvaluations of war, greed, envy, and their destructive impulses are sublimated to the values of peace, generosity, and loving kindness. My father saw a way by which man might change his thinking to achieve these ends. There's no longer time to put off spreading the message. I leave you with a simple but apt quotation from Jean-Paul Sartre. Philosophy is nothing other than man changing the world. Unless you each are functioning in that spirit every day, you are failing my father's memory. Thank you. I thought that Jan's own words would be an emotionally powerful way to end this, but I can't because there's one more step though I'd like to propose that we all take a look at. If you are already incorporating the theory of formal axiology and value theory in every way that you can, in every opportunity that you have, in addition to your use of the instrument, I want to say that there's still a part of Hartman's legacy that has been grossly underrated, understudied, and we can get there starting today. We went to the library in 2018 we discovered a very short 20-page manuscript entitled simply, My Work. It was not dated. My guess is Hartman had begun writing it probably in the final year or two of his life. Did not get very far, but I, in reading it, I think this was intended to be a summation by Hartman of his life's work. In this manuscript, My Work, he refers to what he called his teleological period, as well as his axiological period. In the early half of Hartman's professional career, he did a lot of work in teleology. Now, I didn't even know what the word meant. I went to a dictionary to look it up. Teleology, teleology refers to deliberate action over time. Now, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But Hartman said, once I discovered axiology, 
I just put aside all my earlier work in teleology. But in my work, he said, I think now I see my way to a synthesis between both of those. And then the manuscript ends. There are three people at the Institute who I believe can serve to us as guides into this teleological period of Hartman's work. I believe two of those three are here with us today. Uh, Doug Lawrence, who's done a lot of study in field theory. Uh, Leonardo Gomez, is Leonardo here? Thank you. Who brought to my attention Hartman's teleological work. And Steve Byram, who cannot be here today, who's also studied a lot of Hartman's dissertation and his early work. Together, I hope you will be our guides into fleshing out this other aspect of Hartman that many of us, myself included, know so little about. Now, while we were in the archives again, we discovered a different manuscript entitled The Structure of Personality. It's about 100 pages long. It was either a book or a presentation. I can't tell which. This was apparently intended to be the first part of a two-part book or presentation. In the, structure, in the Structure of Personality, you'll find strains of thought of Alfred North Whitehead and of Abraham Maslow. Many of us know that he was strongly influenced by Maslow, but it's hard sometimes to see that influence. Hartman wrote in this manuscript, we propose a model of personality based on certain considerations of ethics and value theory. It consists of two parts, which we call the teleological model and the axiological model, respectively. He goes on, the teleological model is based on the hypothesis that a personality is a process in time. In terms of this process, it defines and analyzes self-actualization. In particular, the growth of the self and the succession of life situations. This model is dynamic. The dynamic arises from the dimension of time. The axiological model regards personality as a relational structure. In terms of the structure, it defines and analyzes the self. In particular, the relationship between the self and the concept of the self and the relationship between either the self and the concept of self and the environmental situation. This model is static. Its static character arises by taking the time dimension out of the first model. In other words, axiology and the HVP in particular take a snapshot in time of someone's value structures. But it takes a teleological understanding to help that person make a difference in their thought patterns over time. Isn't that what coaching is about? Don't we need to know more about Hartman's teleological model? He goes on to say both models are equally important and give different aspects of personality. Both models are derived deductively but correspond to certain models arrived at inductively by psychologists. In the following only the first model will be presented, the second will be presented at a later date. We have not yet found the second manuscript, if it exists, but I believe there may be gold sitting in this first manuscript that we discovered. I'm pleased to announce that at this conference, Leonardo will be sharing with us uh, his knowledge of Hartman's teleological period, and in fact, sharing with us his beta version of a teleological assessment tool based on Hartman's work, and that's tomorrow afternoon. Folks, there remains so much of Hartman's work that we do not know, but which is certainly worth knowing. Let's commit to working together, as John Hartman exhorted us to do, to bring Hartman's knowledge to this world, starting wherever we are, one step at a time, individually and collectively, to move forward in a spirit of cooperation, not competition, to preserve, refine, and advance Hartman's legacy. And if we do that, starting this week, we can begin to change the world.
Thank you. Thank you, Cliff, <laughs> for bringing us uh, attention to the broad span of uh, Hartman's intellect and his work. Throughout the history of this institute, which was established as a, an institute to provide a, a, a place where the formal and the applied part of axiology could move on into the future. As uh, we know, and from what Cliff has said, it's the applied aspect which uh, has moved forward better than the formal aspect. And one of the things that I think that we really need to do is appreciate that because it's that applied aspect, it's those uh, users of the Hartman in value inventory, as it was called in the early days, and then the Hartman value profile, as he began to refine it, and the derivatives of that. Taking that out into the world is part of what has kept us alive for 43 years, and kept other aspects of what we're trying to do vital. And uh, we need to really appreciate that and then integrate our movement to make the world better into all of these other areas and thoughts and thought processes which Hartman had, uh, which we need to uh, exploit and uh, move forward with. So I thank you for being, my being here today as the old timer, <laughs> the uh, one of the persons who, I was not a founding member of the Institute. Uh, that was a group of four people, but I was uh, a member from the very first meeting forward. And so I have been involved uh, for all of that time. My relationship to Hartman is due to my wife who took a course from him at the University of Tennessee and said, you must meet this person. And I did. And uh, so from 1968 to 73, for the time that he uh, was alive, we had a very vital uh, involvement. So at this time, we will take questions, uh, comments, conversation about uh, Cliff's presentation. And Jen has a microphone to supply to anyone uh, who would like to ask a question or make a comment. We are recording this, so we ask you if you'll ask a question in the mic that will help the recorder. I was just going to say that it was your presentation was very inspirational. I'm not sure that's working. And you did a great job. Well, thank you. That needs to be up. Okay, I, I'm curious. Is there anything in the uh, uh, printed versions or in the archives or in the institute of the tele, what is it tele, 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 uh, that we can study and read uh, anything like that yet? Yes, I. Um, since we got back 15 months ago, I've been preserving and, and printing as many of these as I could. We're doing a workshop this afternoon at 3.30, and I will share with you in, in three-ring binder format uh, those two references, my work, which I've transcribed in this teleological model. Uh, Hartman also had uh, an entire book written and published in German in 1958 called A Partnership of Capital and Labor, which if you heard about the Business Roundtable lately and Mark Benioff's comments, I believe the time is ripe for that to see the light of day. Absolutely. Um, I, I, we digitized the first two chapters of the seven chapter book. I, I believe we ought to get to chapter three, but the last four chapters are more examples. And the two examples he uses there, are one is Lincoln Electric, which is still continuing to do well, but the other was Sears. <laughs> so, it, they, you know, so we might publish a smaller version just to the theoretical part, not the actual there. Um, what also excited me very much, if you were at the conference Two years ago, Jay Morris came, having spent some time in the archives, 
And he discovered a monumentally long book, completed but never published, written by Hartman in 1943, uh, 43, the middle of World War II, entitled On God's Side. It's 850 pages long. I read it, I've only started, I've printed about half of it, so you can look at what I've printed. Um, it's an incredible insight into the spiritual causes of war. I'm not sure what we can do with it. Will the world read an 850 page book? Do we need to publish it in several volumes? Do we need to write an edited version of it? These are questions that we need to chew on. Uh, so what I'd like to do is share with you the progress we're making now towards what uh, I see as the second book in this series. We've published the five lectures. The second one on the end of sovereignty is about three quarters transcribed. Um, Art shared with me some valuable insight we might add to it today. Uh, I felt that was important to get out because of the state of international relations today and because after all, that's what Hartman was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for. Not a theory of axiology, not a Hartman value profile, but for working to stop nuclear proliferation. Um, so, but after that, the question becomes, how should we prioritize what's next? Should it be this teleological model? Should it be labor and capital and so forth? So we'll show and tell this afternoon, and I'll be asking your input into what ought to be next, and there's a lot more we haven't seen. As an aside, briefly, uh, tell them about your contact with a gentleman who still is involved with profit sharing based on Hartman's uh, model. Sure, I got a call about a year ago from a fellow who's, and I forget the name of the institute, but there's a professional membership organization of financial advisors who help corporations set up 401ks and 403bs in a way as a way to finance the retirements of people who work for them out of the profits of the company. And it's a national organization. And he said, Cliff, do you realize that our entire organization is built on Hartman's work? Hartman was also a founder of the in the Council of Profit Sharing Industries in the 1950s. And that notion of profit sharing is what has now morphed into 401k programs. He said, Cliff, the idea that Hartman came up with in the 1950s when he founded that institute has now created $7 trillion of personal wealth in America alone, and no one knows it started with Hartman. I've been working on, on Hartman as a provider, as a supplier for the last 20 years. Uh, and this is the first conference I've been to, although I've been urged to come for a long time. One, one thing that I, I, you're talking a lot about looking back in the archives and, and thinking about Hartman and, and what he said and how he thought. Uh, how much of that is, is looking forward? So we're, we're you, know, you, you spent a long time looking backward, but how much of the time is looking forward? How, how, much, is, how much of the thought patterns are going into, into advancing his work? Not just his work, but, but taking it even further. I envision a time when all of us start writing um, forward-looking applications or theorizations of what he began. There is so much there that we don't even know. I'm looking backwards first. Hartman himself is a very forward thinker. Just ask yourself, what if he had been successful in convincing the United States and the United Nations to turn over their nuclear arsenals to the UN? We'd be in a different world today right now. We would not be nervous about North Korea and Iran the way we are today. Um, I think that's forward looking. I came across another manuscript. I don't think it'll be published, but it was written in the 1950s when IBM first came out with their UNIVAC computer, it was the only handful of computers in the world, Hartman was predicting that someday machine algorithms will be able to understand the value structures of someone's thinking by the way they write. That's before he even had desktop computers. Computers were at that time were capable of classifying chemicals by their chemical compounds in a very binary way but a more complicated way than people could do. That's all he had to go on. He was already predicting that could be, um, be done to, to written and verbal speech. I think that's fascinating. 
But this is a, a key point that you raise because the forward thinking part is exactly where we need to be moving. Um, Cliff, I think it was again inspiring and it reminded me of the, the potential we have with students especially. But with people that are not studying, um, I have a student that moved to California from Norway. And his reading of Freedom to Live has changed his life. You should hear some of the things that he's saying. And it shook me when I was reading his, his paper on that book, because he is looking ahead. But he's looking to the past, too. He's talking about the, the terror that they still feel in Norway because Hitler had taken them over. And they're beginning to see reflections of it in the world today and how Hartman is taking them back to themselves so they can begin to see how they can grow. And that's one of the things you pointed out there and I thought that we've got to keep that in mind. So thanks for doing that and thanks for all you're doing with the, the research and the publication. I think it's going to help us so much. You're welcome. By the way, um, I also, and I'll share those this afternoon, Hartman went back to Europe in 1946, sponsored by, I believe, a council of churches, and to see how's Europe recovering. And one essay he wrote was called A Report from Europe. The other was The Treatment of Displaced Persons in Sweden. And he had great admiration for what Sweden was doing uh, to help rehabilitate and welcome uh, people who survived Nazi um, concentration camps. As I read that, I can't help but think there's a valuable lesson for all of us. If you look at the treatment of refugees in Turkey and Europe and in our own uh, southern border, uh, Hartman's message has a very forward-looking message to it, too. If someone would study that and apply it to today, referencing him, we could get some publicity and make the world a better place. We can take one more question. <laughs> Could you explain to us the current funding mechanism for continuing research and uh, what kind of a vehicle exists for us to invest in future research? Thank you. It's a good question. The Gore School of Business uh, funded that trip for 10 days for us to go there. It was enough to cover our travel expenses, not any of our time. Um, Art and Charlotte Ellis have very generously made a contribution of $5,000 to seed this uh, publication fund. My hope is that as we roll out these books and put them on the market, enough people will buy them. The Institute has agreed to put the proceeds from the books back into the same fund to feed the next ones. Um, we, if you were at the reception last night, you may have met Tim McConaughey. He's an independent book publishing consultant. Uh, he's given us a 75% reduction in his rates to be our advisor on this. Um, we've hired a communications student at a very good rate to uh, lay out the books in InDesign under Tim's tutelage. And we're bringing these books into print. My original estimate is that whenever we sell 200 copies, we will have broken even on that book. So the five lectures came out in April. It's not broken, breaking even yet. But if we can, we can not only maintain the fund that Art and Charlotte have given us, but advance it. The process of keying and retyping these manuscripts is very, very cumbersome. They're so old, they don't scan well enough to digitally transcribe. Uh, Steve Byram has offered to take over the transcription of On God's Side, and I don't know how far along he is. Uh, so right now it's a labor of love by those of us who like to type. And anyone who wants to join in that effort would like to put some, I, I would love to have more people who are willing to just spend the grunt time to rekey these. I also, we will need proofreaders. People who can look at the original manuscript, look at the type manuscript and say, are we true to it? There's some grammatical changes that, that I make as editor, um, but another pair of eyes is always important. <laughs> Go to the new website, Hartman. Institute.org, there's a drop-down box uh, under the About section. It says Contribution, and we will recognize you on that page. And if you are inspired, 
can contribute there. The another way to contribute is encourage colleagues, friends, people who you work with, become a member. And we would like to grow the membership. So those are other ways to fund what they're doing. Twitter. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna, and we have a Twitter link now. We have a new baby Twitter page. Not this, but when I want to mention that. I'll put it up on the board. But if you can start sharing there, again, visibility leads to, to access to our website, which leads to more members, more funding, and maybe some contributions and inspiration. I'd, I'd like to continue our conversation about the publications when we can look at them. It's a show and tell session. Jen and I aren't talking. We will spread out everything that we found and give you a chance to pour through them and talk about what do you think we ought to do next and next after that. And if, if there's a project one of you really want to get involved with, uh, we need volunteers. Okay, well, thank you so much for getting us kicked off. Thank you.